Hi, everyone. Today, we will be talking about the psychoepistemology of art. That's an essay which appeared in the Romantic Manifesto. Uh, the, art, the essay, as such, was published in April of 1965, and is the first one which appears in this book. Uh, today, we have two people with great knowledge in Ayn Rand's philosophy to help us uh, throughout the discussion uh, that we will develop through the, the discussion of the essay. First of all, we have James Valiant. He's an author uh, of The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics. Um, and he and also about, he has written Creating Christ, How Roman Emperors Invented Christianity. And he's a re regular here in uh, Ayn Rand Center UK. And also we have Don Watkins joining us and he will actually be joining us in the next Wednesday's discussions uh, from now on. Uh, he's an American writer and has co-authored co several books. Uh, and um, um, he also has great knowledge in the field. Um, so I was wondering if we could start the discussion uh, creating, talking about some of the key concepts that appear throughout the essay. And the first one that comes into mind is uh, psychopistemology. I was wondering if we could give some ex examples uh, and chew a little bit of the, the concept, which is kind of new uh, in the sense that I think Ayn Rand was the one who coined the, the, the topic, the, the, the concept. So I was wondering if we could bring it over and say what it is and how we can know what it is. Well, there is distinctly philosophical questions that relate to the validity and how cognition functions. And there's distinctly psychological questions that basically refer to subconscious uh, elements in our uh, consciousness, where emotions come from and so forth and personal development. There's sort of a hinterland. And it's not just because psychology is still a new science emerging from philosophy. There are actually certain questions that directly overlap in those two fields. For example, the cognitive nature of emotions, free will, the relationship between consciousness and existence. All those are actually simultaneously questions of philosophy and questions of psychology. And so there's an interaction between our emotions, if you will, and our cognition. And that the study of that interaction is what Ayn Rand, the a field Ayn Rand herself defined uh, and discovered, the interaction between our, the subconscious and the co conscious cognitive functions of our consciousness. Um, and it relates in terms of examples, uh, it, each of us sort of has a unique uh, uh, mode of cognition. Not that reason isn't the, valid, the only valid way of obtaining knowledge, but we have certain habituated approaches to cognition and these can be rooted in psychology. And certain psychological issues can be rooted in deeper philosophical issues. And so there's this interplay. One can have, for example, based on psychological reasons, a certain approach to cognition, uh, something that be more specific that objectivists call rationalism or empiricism, a certain approach to cognition, a habitual approach to cognition, which is char which characterizes uh, the way we think as an individual that is in part informed by our psychology, by our subconscious uh, development. In part, it's formed by philosophy as well. And that's why we need a term psychoepistemology, a field that discusses sort of the interaction of those two to understand how an individual approaches both cognitive issues and certain basic psychological issues. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add a little bit to that. So from objectivism's perspective, and I don't think this is written in stone, but at least the, the typical way of thinking about it is that psychology basically has two main areas. One is motivation, which is dealing with essentially the overlap between psychology and values. And so you can think about the work that Brandon did in self-esteem under Ayn Rand's auspices as focus on the issue of motivation. And then it's psychoepistemology. And there's kind of two broad aspects of psychoepistemology in her view. So there's the kind of universals of the interaction between the conscious mind and the subconscious things like memory, learning, creativity. But then there's the study of the ways in which human beings differ in the way that they use their mind. And that would be things like James talked about rationalism, empiricism, um, 
there's a much wider perspective. There's just kind of emotionalist. There's, there's a whole range of things, but that's what psychoepistemology would study, it would study the different kind of manner, uh, habitual manner of thinking that people have both universally and distinctively similar. And so the, the, it's, it's a really rich field and, I mean, objectivists have only scratched the surface of it. Harry Binswinger gave two really path-breaking lectures on it that you can find on YouTube. And um, his wife, Jean Maroney, has done a a lot more in that area as well as others. But I mean, here, what we are going to get is kind of um, that concept as used to help us untangle the role of art. And so it it's, it's helpful to have a sense of what Ayn Rand is talking about here. Thank you. Um, another key concept that, that she goes over is uh, metaphysical value judgments. And, and for me, that one is, I think, the hardest to, to get what she's trying to go over with, because on the one hand, it doesn't seem to be concepts related to ethics, but at the same time, she puts the word values in, in there. So first of all, what are metaphysical value judgments and um, what, why are there values if maybe they are not completely related to the field of ethics, if I'm saying that correctly? Well, they're not values. So it's that the way that she thinks about it is that there's a view of the world and part of, and a view of human nature, the kind of relationship that human beings stand into the world that are going to shape your ethics. And so she gives, uh, I think it's worth quoting because it gives you a flavor of what she's talking about. Some of the questions that um, one has implicit or explicit answers to that are going to constitute what she calls metaphysical value judgment. So these are just some examples. It's not exhaustive, but it's, is the universe intelligible to man or unintelligible and unknowable? Can man find happiness on earth or is he doomed to frustration and despair? Does man have the power of choice, the power to choose his goals and to achieve them, the power to direct the course of his life, or is he the helpless plaything of forces beyond his control, which determine his fate? Is man by nature to be valued as good or to be despised as evil? And so she's saying that these are these are not oughts, they're not norms. It's not you should do X, you should do Y. But I think it's pretty clear that there's certain views of how you should live that follow from those. Or at least here's a different way to think about it. What's possible to you is going to be shaped by your answer to those questions. And that's what metaphysical value judgments are. You can think about it's what's possible to you that's going to then shape what should you do. And one one thing that I think is worth clarifying is she's using metaphysical here in a wider sense than in the OPAR sense. So the OPAR sense of metaphysics, it's super delimited. Basically, it, Leonard puts it as its existence exists and the corollaries to the axiom. But she's using metaphysics here in a wider sense to pertain to um, what we would think of as metaphysics, epistemology, and human nature. It's kind of basic questions about the kind of world we live in that are going to shape how should we live in that world? Right. The answer is to philosophical level questions about reality. Maybe not just pertaining strictly to the field of metaphysics, but pertaining to reality, but at the philosophical level of abstraction. And so they're sort of the pre-ethical questions as Don indicated. And the answers to those questions will necessarily and profoundly impact the way we approach values as such all the way down the line. Thank you. Um, and I think the third concept, which I think is the most obvious in, in the sense of what the topic that we're trying to go over, but maybe it would be easy to delimit or to show the audience what we're talking about is art. Um, could you provide some examples and delimit what are we going to say what art is and what art it is, what is, what is not art in this discussion? Well, that's it. Ayn Rand is here addressing some of the most basic questions about art that philosophers have been wrestling with for quite some time. She's giving a very distinct and radical answer to what art is. But questions like, what is the value of art since it really serves no utilitarian function? 
right? It doesn't put bread on the table. It's really they're just there to contemplate and consider. So why is it so important? What function does it actually serve in human, the human psychology? The answers to the questions of what, the most fundamental answer to the question of what art is and why it's important to human beings are being answered in this essay, directly being answered in this essay, defining why art, art is in this special category of addressing the universal as opposed to some specific value. Why it's not, for example, didactic, why it doesn't serve a principally educational function, but a, a valuative mechanism feeding function, a psychological function. Understanding the primary answers to what art is, is going on here. And you need the concept of psychoepistemology to really unpack that. Well, I think it's I also important question. that, um, so it's notable that doesn't, she doesn't start with a definition of art, that she gets to a definition of art. And it's one thing that will be baffling to people that is often baffling to people is like she'll exclude things like non-objective art, non-objective painting, say that's not art. And you'll often, I certainly did this when I was, you know, a 16 year old objectivist, get into arguments with people and say, no, because the definition of art is such and such and whatever. And her, and rather you have to see how she's thinking about it, which is, okay, we have a general idea of art is that it's something that's universal, but it's very personal and people's reactions to it. And then she's going to unearth kind of why is it so, why do we have these uh, ma major reactions to it? What is the root of our need for it? And it's only after getting an answer to the question of why human beings need art that then we can define it and say, well, there, not everything that quote looks like art that hangs on a wall can, can fulfill this need. So in other words, it's by understanding the need that art fulfills that allows us to give a precise definition of art and that we can thereby exclude things from the realm of art that have superficial similarities to it. So, I mean, one way to one implication of this is that I think it'll be interesting towards the end of our conversation to circle back to the definition of art and, and rather than kind of start with it and try to deduce from it, because she's definitely not doing that. And there's a real temptation to do that. Really good point. Yes. Uh, so given this introduction by Don, I was wondering if we could go over the essay and try to give the, the essence of what she's trying to go over with, uh, which Don basically has uh, already done. So, um, her point is is that right she's going over saying okay there's something there let's try to go over it um i was wondering if you could give a little bit of details on what she's trying to uh say in this essay in essence well i'll say a little bit uh and i'd love to hear uh jim <laughs> kind of elaborate on some of these points but i think it's as a starting point it's helpful to get the larger project she's in, she's engaged in so you have to think this is several years after atlas shrug she's presented her philosophy and in particular she's presented her her ethics where she's arguing that all values are to be understood in survival terms like literal life and death terms and now you have something like art and here's she's devoted her whole life to art so she certainly thinks it's important but most people if you look around, they think it's important. Even people who would say like, I'm not that interested in art. Like, do they listen to music? Yeah, they probably listen to music. So there's this kind of universal need, something that we, uh, or rather I'm jumping ahead. There's this universal interest and in response to art and it's deeply personal and passionate. And her view is, look, nothing like this can be detached from an actual human need. And so we need to understand it because it's a weird sort of thing. It doesn't serve any practical purpose, any utilitarian function. It's not like you read art and now you have a bigger house or something like that. So there's a real question of well, what in the world is this all about? What really is this survival need? And here's a, a formulation where she's getting at this point that I think is worth reading. And then uh, Jim, if you want to kind of like take it in terms of what her answer is, but she says, 
No human emotion can be causeless, nor can so intense an emotion be causeless, irreducible, and unrelated to the source of emotions and of values, to the needs of a living entity's survival. Art does have a purpose and does serve a human need, only it is not a material need, but a need of man's consciousness. Art is inextricably tied to man's survival, not to his physical survival, but to that on which his physical survival depends, to the preservation and survival of his consciousness. Well, that is the answer. And this more specific answer is that we're beings of a conceptual uh, cogn cognitive nature. We are conceptual. That's how we know. Our concepts are abstractions. They are not any particular, they are mental units. They're not something really in reality. There's good factual reasons. And it's really, you can see how it's really based on her full understanding of human consciousness and how her understanding of the role of concepts is really critical here. Our concepts are based on a fact of reality, some, you know, a commeasurable quality that can, be, that can help us form an abstraction. That's a fact of reality. On the other hand, the abstraction itself is purely a mental thing. And to hold our abstractions, simply uh, cognitively, we need, for example, words. We need language, as she points out in this essay, to provide a concrete, pinned down way so that we can render perceptual this mental abstraction that covers a potentially infinite number of concretes. So we need to use a concrete simply to pin down this mental abstraction, to give it reality, so that we can deal with it. In effect, the same thing is going on with art. We need to render perceptual our abstract metaphysical value judgments so that we can experience them emotionally. So in effect, just as words render perceptual our abstractions so that we can deal with them cognitively, so art renders perceptual our metaphysical value judgments so that we can emotionally deal with them without an understanding basically of how human consciousness works, you cannot see how this is an essential fuel, an essential mechanism that actually helps our consciousness function. <clears throat> Art helps consciousness function in an analogous way that uh, words help abstractions uh, be help us deal with them, put, render them into a fashion we can deal with them. So art renders our values perceptual in a way that we can emotionally process them. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add a little uh, bit to that, which is, so if you think about, we've talked about in past episodes, philosophy is a worldview and that we all have this worldview in one form or another and that what the value of studying philosophy is, is to make it explicit and under your control and think, is my philosophy true? Is my worldview true? But here it's the idea of a worldview is massively abstract, as, as Jim was just talking about. Like, what's your worldview? Well, I mean, it, I mean, it takes Leonard, what, 800 pages in Opar to spell out in the most condensed form a, a whole worldview. You can't, and those are all very abstract, you know, principles that he's putting together. You, but if you really need philosophy to guide your life, you need to be able to hold it in a condensed manner. You need to be able to boil down your worldview into something you can kind of get your hands around, right? And so that's what art is going to do. It's going to show you a worldview instead of explaining and telling you a worldview. It's here, look, it's, uh, you know, Atlas Shrugged. It's the, the David. Here's a worldview embodied in something that's tangible. And intellectually, you need that. You need that to be able to, um, understand and apply your worldview, but you also need it then, as, as Jim was saying, emotionally as the refueling. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as we go along. But if you just think that like life can be really hard and it's hard to hold on, if you want to think about it, it's we're often acting very long range and we're experiencing setbacks and drawbacks and forces pushing us away from our vision of what we want from life. And what art allows us to do emotionally is experience the achievement of the life we're struggling for. And Ayn Rand thinks that's really important. One of the things that she is deeply interested in from very early on, and if you think about We the Living, is the idea of what you can think of as spiritual survival versus spiritual suffering and even spiritual suicide. 
And that's like what we see with Leo versus Kira in We the Living is uh, Leo is somebody who is committing spiritual suicide. He doesn't have the kind of sustenance he needs to keep going. And that is a very extreme form of something that Ayn Rand thinks is really common, which is this struggle to maintain your view of life in the face of challenges and setbacks. And she thinks art is crucial to being able to maintain uh, that kind of spiritual fuel. She has that wonderful discussion where she compares what a moral treatise would be versus seeing a literary projection of heroes and villains. So for example, the examples she uses specifically in this essay, Howard Rourke and Babbitt. We have a Babbitt and I can tell you a thousand concretes that immediately come to mind when you tell me what a Babbitt is once you've read Sinclair Lewis's novel. Same is true with Howard Rourke. Suddenly without the, uh, the virtue of selfishness, without a Leonard Peikoff's lectures, just with the projection of Howard Rourke's character, I know what her view of man is. I know what is possible through Howard Rourke he can serve as an inspiration to me. Personally, in my life, Howard Rourke was a psychological lifesaver. The idea that that was at least possible concretely, just as it was for the kid on the bicycle and Howard Rourke, it, seeing Howard Rourke's uh, architecture in the Monadnock Valley. Howard Rourke doesn't even realize that he gave the young man an inspiration for a lifetime to become a composer. Um, and that's the role, uh, as Don indicates, that art can serve. Um, inspiring that young composer by showing him what's possible. Howard Rourke did that for me, concretized in a much more powerful way uh, than, you know, I regard The Virtue of Selfishness as a revolutionary book, perhaps the most important book ever written in the field of ethics. And yet the projection of Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead is a much more concrete way for me to realize, experience, and deal with what it is to live my values as a hero. I I was wondering if we could go over the a little bit of the beginning, which is one of the things that strikes me as extremely interesting of Rand, which is don't take art for granted in the sense that people usually take it as okay, there's this thing, don't analyze it, go over it. And, and she says, okay, let's deal with it. Let's start, scratch a little bit what this thing is. So I think one of the things that I'm not sure about is what is, if she doesn't consider the phenomenon of art, well, well maybe that's not precise. Uh, if, if she doesn't think that taking it as a primary or the, the emotional thing as a primary, what does she think that it's the primary in this discussion. Is it the fact that is it the fact that we have the particular consciousness, the primary in in her development of the yet over the argumentation? Or it's not the content, it's the having the evaluative mechanism. It's having that emotional mechanism. It's needing emotions as fuel. It's not so much the particulars here that she's talking about, she's talking about our need psychologically for it, right? In order to really think clearly about our values, we really have to feel those values. In order to feel those values, we have to think clearly about those values in an objectivist ideal sense. <clears throat> what she's saying here is that both are in effect vital to the proper functioning of human consciousness. An evaluative mechanism that inspires us and keeps us moving and going because we are beings with such an emotional mechanism as well as the cognitive aspects that underlie it. In fact, it motivates our cognitive clarity if used properly. <clears throat> she can't get into issues like that in this essay, but there's, a, role, there's a, a, a positive feedback role between emotions and thinking, thinking and emotions. That's how our consciousness works. And that's just happens to be how our consciousness works. We have an evaluative mechanism that must discover and choose values. And because of that, rendering them concrete in a way that we can emotionally experience them is vital to the healthy functioning of our consciousness. Okay, thank you. Um, I think another issue here is um, the personal value 
of art. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, because I think that there are certain interpretations of art as actually social. And I mean, I, I come from a country which in the 30s was a big propaganda thing and these things are still going on and there are like these super boring, super awful statues and a very specific kind of architecture. So why, why does she say that, that it's personal? And um, why, why would, would it not be a social issue as some people used to claim? Well, I mean, so in part of the build up to that point, right? One of the things she's talking about is the complete impoverishment in terms of people's inner lives that people are not that tend to not be that introspective and not understand their own reactions to things. And part of what she's, what I don't know if you'd say assuming or arguing, it's not exactly argued for in any great depth, but it's that you are, you need to understand your inner world and that's really vital to your ability to flourish, that you have a consciousness, you know, you're not just kind of a, a hulk of meat. And so then it's, all right, well, if we want to understand our inner world, one thing that's really going to be crucial is that people are really interested in art. They have big reactions to them and they're personal in this sense is you have the experience of not just, I don't like that, but it feels like somehow an attack on me if something's really bad. And if you think about the debates friends will get into with art, it's like not, it, like they're, they're as vicious as debates over politics because there's, it's, you're attacking my identity or you just seem like a crazy alien to me if you think that this is good and this is bad. Now, I should say though, that you might not agree with that or at least it might not be obvious to you because I think, not you, but <laughs> some listeners, um, part of what I think has happened is that like people don't, like it, you're not like inherently as a human being necessarily going to have profound aesthetic experiences. And I think one of the things she talks about in other places in her writing is that there's such a garbage in terms of what the culture offers us in, to art that most that many people have not really had what would be a truly aesthetic experience. They've had pieces of it. And she'll talk about in bootleg romanticism, like, you know, the kind of kick you'll get from reading a detective novel or somebody who, you know, is watching Breaking Bad. But here she's really concerned with aesthetic experience, which is this, which is, I, she thinks, and I agree, deeply personal. And it's experienced that way. It's experience is somehow very uh, speaking to the core of my soul is the kind of language, you know, that sometimes people will talk about. And so the personal nature of it is part of the experience. But A, you have to have that experience. And B, you have to introspect a little bit to get that, that, that that's what's going on. And because it is so personal and powerful, that's one reason why then it can be used and is used by people who have kind of more political or power seeking agendas or other kinds of agendas. They in effect take art that is powerful for these personal reasons and use it for kind of propagandistic reasons and so on. So it's not that art can't be used that way, but that, if you reflect on, well, why can it be used that way? It's precisely because it's so personally powerful, at least as a potential. Yeah. I mean, in your country's history, in the 1930s, the struggle between the communists and the fascists, to have a bunch of fascist developed art around you. Now, that's value judgments. Those are political value judgments that are being largely expressed in political art, whether it's fascist or communist art, right? And if it's a didactic purpose, if it's an educational purpose, it's only serving a very one-dimensional, shallow sort of issue, uh, isn't it? It really can't get at the sort of powerful issues that art can and should get at. On, that's why Ayn Rand is very much opposed to propaganda in art or primarily didactic art. That's not its function. On the other hand, consider the personal meaning. If your world, if your religion is politics, 
<laughs> it's ob and even political value judgments are based on deeper philosophical issues. It's going to have a personal meaning to the political struggle, uh, you know, between Franco and the communists in the 1930s. <clears throat> so art can be used, it can be used in a psychologically powerful way. Look how Nazis used it in Germany. My gosh, look how Mussolini used it in Italy. Look how the Soviets used it. Art can be a powerful thing and can transmit a powerful message. <clears throat> but the most powerful message it can deliver is never a political one, although that can be an emotional one in itself. The power that, the potential power that art has is to go way beyond anything political and to go right to the most important issues that inform your values, your character, your psychology. And those, of course, have to get to a philosophical level. They have to be philosophical level questions. When we get to those kind of questions, they will necessarily have the core effect on each of us personally. If they're expressed in an emotional way, in a stylized concrete that evokes those metaphysical values, they will directly address the most important issues that are necessarily of the most important personal nature. People will have, as Don points out, violent reactions. And let me suggest that even more than political propaganda art, really good art that addresses more abstract philosophical issues will invoke an even more violent and personal reaction. Necessarily, the wider the abstraction, the more ground it covers. Thank you. So given this, we have established that art is a phenomenon that we must uh, analyze. And also now we have established that it is something deeply personal, but at the same time, it's personal also because it can evoke big emotions in you. Uh, and then she tries to go over the nature of emotions and the nature of concepts. So I was one, uh, specific, especially in the, in, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, a little bit both, but one of the things when I reread the essay is that she talks about a lot about what concepts are. Um, so I was wondering, why do you think that she goes through a, such a thorough explanation of that? Um, yeah. Art is really the, uh, one of the climaxes of philosophy. It depends upon the questions, earlier questions in philosophy in a really important way. Um, it depends upon our understanding of metaphysics. It depends upon whether we think humans have free will, very importantly, as she points out. It depends on our understanding of cognition, whether we're capable of knowing. It depends upon, most critically, that we are conceptual beings and that we can live in a world of abstractions. We think with abstractions that are really mental units. And so we need in order to properly deal with them, to render them concrete as conceptual beings. It depends upon values, our approach to values, our need for values. Without those quest basic questions being answered, we are hopeless in understanding the role that art serves in human life. Absolutely hopeless. That's why she goes through. Now, specifically, one of the things you asked, what are emotions? One of the great mysteries it really, in the history of the study of aesthetics, most people approach the subject, they take emotions for granted. They should just sort of hear their givens. This is the way I feel. <clears throat> that is, of course, not satisfactory to Ayn Rand. She needs to understand where emotions come from, what are emotions, and that requires we understand value judgments, why we have values, all the way down. <clears throat> Without that understanding, we're, again, hopeless in understanding the role of art. So getting behind what emotions are, a cognitive theory of emotions will now help us understand where emotions come from and how they inform art, how values, our values, are what art is about, not our emotions, fundamentally, even though the emotional reaction is the whole end of art. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so after that, she also discusses something that will she will integrate a little bit further, 
and this is related with psychopistemology, which is basically she she talks about how people can use words to denote concepts, and that that is some of the uh, one of the main uh, purposes of psychopistemology. You know how how to deal with abstractions in a perceptual way, uh, which are words. Uh, I was wondering if you have any comments on that. Uh, no. no. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, here, so if you think about, I mean, she's trying to explain something, you know, super complex. So what she's getting with the words example, and I think Jim talked about this before, but we can, it's helpful to reiterate it in this context, right? Is that you're trying to basically boil down what's overwhelming in perception into something that you can deal with and have this automatic single this single unit that's automatically standing in your mind for things that would be overwhelming if you tried to dealt with them individually, right? Like, you know, if you're trying to understand like what should I feed my cat, you need abstract knowledge about cats and food and so on. And you couldn't do it if you just walked around the earth looking at cats and trying to like hold it all in mind. Like once you've seen four or five, then you forget, you know, the first ones. And, but we can use the word, but we can formulate an abstraction cat, right? That's going to stand for all of the cats. But the cat, the word is a concrete. You've boiled down this abstract perspective that relates all these things in reality into a single concrete. And so that's kind of the psychoepistemological function of words you can put it is that they're a mental concrete that stands for an abstraction or an abstract perspective on many or really an indefinite number of concretes. And if you think about what her argument is in art, it's, it's that same process. It's that same using a concrete to stand for an abstraction. But here it's on a, um, I don't know that you want to say a more profound scale because I mean, the, like words, like that's an incredible profound scale. But if it's, but it's, here you have, instead of a concrete that stands for a bunch of cats, here you have a concrete that stands for a philosophy or for a worldview, for a whole view of existence. And that is really, if you think th that's the parallel she's drawing, it's that you're boiling down something you can't hold in mind and you need to hold in mind, right? Like we need to, if you want to own a cat, you need to be able to hold a right, cat, food, you know, kibbles, whatever you kind of feed them, right? There, you need to hold abstract knowledge in mind. And it's, if you want to live a life, you need to be able to hold a whole view of life in mind. And indeed, you need to be able to hold many different worldviews in mind because you're selecting between them and you need to understand people who have a different worldview. And so how in the world can we do that? And, and that's what art allows you to do. And it's, then that makes clear, well, why is art a value? Well, it's precisely because you need to do that. And this is, uh, I, I'm going to butcher it, but one of the best statements that uh, Leonard Peikoff has in Opar, where he, get, he gets that, um, you know, art is not sufficient to live, but it, neither is philosophy. It's that you need both. You need to have abstract guidance, but you need to be able to hold what that guidance is aimed at or is uh, the whole constellation of ideas it's related to in mind and experience it emotionally and that's that that's what she's really arguing here and that's why she's starting i think with this parallel to words because it's the same process um but it's certainly easier to see the kind of roots of that prog process by focusing on the relationship between words and abstractions so um in this context, is uh, she she goes over what art is right after she says that there is something there. Uh, there's um, that met metaphysics cannot be retained as such, and then one must have a way in which metaphysics can be uh, expressed and also. Um, retain and observe and then she goes over the uh the, her definition of art uh so why do you think she chooses that moment to introduce the definition of art 
just a, a caution here. Remember what Don said earlier. We're not talking about metaphysics in the strict sense of this is just existence and identity. We're talking about big, broad metaphysical assertions. And so she'll use the phrase metaphysical value judgments. That is to say, the, the reality, the reality that informs our approach to values. That's yeah, what she so means I, by metaphysical value judgments. Yeah, and I think the the answer to your question, I don't have the, I should have kept the book in front of me to get exactly where she does this. Um, but if it's, so if you think about what I was just describing about, she's arguing that the function of art is to make the, um, make a metaphysical, make metaphysical value judgments into a perceptual concrete so that we can hold and contemplate it. Well, it's the, there's a real question then of, well, how do you do that? And so this is kind of the bridge between those two issues. It's this is what art is doing. And then how does it do it? Well, it's a selective recreation of reality. And then the issue is it's the selectivity involved. And so what an artist is doing is he's selecting and picking out this is life as I see it because I'm choosing to include it rather than omit it. So it's the, the way she'll describe it in a different essay is that um, to include something in art is to say, this is important. This is, this is what life is really about as the artist sees it. And so it's, we're, we're bridging now into it's the selectivity that makes, that treats something as metaphysically important. And therefore, that's why we can hold it as this is a, a worldview. It's a worldview because it's, stripping away the accidental and giving us a stylized perspective on the world. And, and so I think, uh, again, without having looked at exactly where it shows up, that's my recollection of why she's bringing it in at that point in the, in the essay. Yeah. It's almost mid midstream, isn't it? In the midst of the essay. I mean, she'll need it. I think she brings it up there because she actually needs it for the rest of the, you know, it really enlightens us about the rest of the essay, but she only gets to it once she's established the philosophical foundation that can help us to even understand what she means. And that requires the, the philosophical basics that go into it, man, the conceptual being. Um, we, she absolutely needs to cover that before we can even grasp the psychoepistemological function of art. And, to do, and we need to under, grasp the psychoepistemological function of art before we can even hope to understand uh, what it is or a proper definition of it. Um, Don, I know that you're a, a novelist. Um, in your experience, has writing and creating some uh, work of art, some work of art, has enlightened the way in which the issue of selective recreation um, and the way that, that do you see that that wording of selective recreation? I mean, has your perspective been more uh, defined after you have written? Um, yeah, well, I'll say this. It drives home the point that the selectivity. Um, so we're, the, the next two chapters are on the idea of sense of life. Um, and part of what her view is, is that so the selectivity applies to every detail, right? So if you're an artist, it's every brushstroke. And her view is that it's not necessarily and often isn't conscious, right? And so one thing that I, I kind of knew going into writing my novel, but definitely came away with afterwards is, you know, there's the old saying in, uh, you know, you go to war with the army you have. Well, you go to art with the subconscious you have or with the sense of life you have. And so the what you what you have to totally accept and be willing to accept is like that i'm going to embody my actual sense of life my actual view in the world which may have and certainly in my case uh, i think definitely does it has certain contradictions to what i would endorse as explicitly right philosophically um and and you know, you can in effect edit out things where you go, no, I disown that, but it's going to show up in a lot of different subtle things. And you just have to accept that like, well, I'm not going to write Atlas Shrugged because I don't have 
uh, and for many reasons, but even just that's not my, you know, that's not my sense of life. And the, and so that's, I think what it drives home is that the selectivity involved is so profound and so overwhelming. If you tried to like enumerate the different choices that are involved in every aspect of an, of a work of art, that it's, it really does reveal your soul and you have to be okay with that. You can't like, you know, guard against it and try to fake a soul. And if you do, what you get is not like we've all encountered like objectivist art that makes you cringe and that it's no, if you want to produce something that is authentically your view of the world, there's it's you go to you go to war with the sense of life you have. See, art is one area where we kind of use our emotions as a guide. Not the final or complete guide, no, but a vital guide, a vital guide for both the creator and the viewer. Absent emotions, and that's what it's playing on. Without the role of emotions, there'd really be no purpose to do art, right? It's because of these emotional reactions we have. So we're not unmindful of other things. Rand could not have plotted a novel without a lot of logic and a lot of clean, pure cognition. On the other hand, Part of what's guiding her are her emotions. As she goes through, as Don says, an editing process, she might rethink some things and adjust some things. But even after all that, the artist and the viewer must recognize that part of what is driving the artist and the art that we see in front of us is our values, values expressed emotionally to evoke an emotional reaction. Selectivity, as Don says, is absolutely vital. Since it is a man-made thing, we as viewers get to assume that nothing there is put there accidentally, whether it's a novel or a painting or a sculpture or anything else, that nothing is there accidentally. If it's there, it was put there on purpose for a reason by the artist. Even if the artist himself did not know the reason, it's there for an emotional reason, and he left it there. Oh, well, Jim, let's pause on that. So this is more in, uh, an aside, but as somebody who's worked with Leonard, um, one of his convictions, so this is editing nonfiction, um, but one of his convictions, you'll often have the experience of inevitably he'll give some feedback and you or somebody who he's giving feedback to will say, well, that's not really what I meant. Like, or, you know, that, 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 like th that word is not what I was going for. It's like, no, there's a reason you put it there, whether you, whether you're, you know, uh, or, uh, whether you're saying it's intentional or not. And this, and, um, the, so the selectivity thing, it, there's a really profound point in that the, the view is that your subconscious is spitting out stuff, even when you're just writing nonfiction, let alone art. Um, but it's spitting out stuff because it's how you're thinking about and viewing the world. And you might not see all the implications and you might even not know why you've included this word or this brush stroke. But there is a reason for it. There's something rooted in your um, knowledge and view of the world that is uh, that has led you to put that on a page. And that there's a real value in taking that seriously, um, just as a communicator and a writer and as an artist. That's part of what you have to think about. And one of the ways that you grow as an artist is to bring more and more of that into conscious control and have reasons for why you're doing things and why you're using this word rather than that word or this brush stroke rather than that brush stroke. Um, and part of your development in any field, I think, is bringing more stuff under conscious control. But the point here is that whether or not you've consciously included it or not, it's part of your view of the world that is ending up on the page because you still had to go through a process of selectivity consciously or subconsciously. And I just have to note, I too have had the experience of being edited by Leonard Pigo, having him go through my first book, The Passion of Lying and Spittics, chapter by chapter, <laughs> giving me detailed <laughs> uh, critique, let's put, it, let's put it as gently as I can was um, a revolutionary experience for me. He is an, an amazing editor and that he brings to bear that exact standard. Each word must be analyzed carefully. Why is it there? What are you saying? Um, nothing can be accidental, even in a work of nonfiction, much less a work of art in which everything is going to be evocative of values. 
there, nothing can even be implicitly accidental if you're a really good artist. You know, a lot of artists will just see to the pants it. They're just doing it emotionally. <clears throat> now they're conveying something, whether they know it or not. By that process of selectivity, a good artist knows what they're doing. Yeah, so that's actually a helpful clarification to give. So when it's that the artist's selectivity is inherent in the art, everything conveys it's important. That doesn't mean that every artist has a consistent view of the world <laughs> that's getting consistently, and I don't just mean consistent, like philosophically right consistent, but I mean that you could say like they have a coherent view of the world. I think a lot of, uh, part of what differentiates great art from bad art is how consistent the view of the world is. A Dostoevsky is a really, let's call it alien to most objectivist view of the world, but it's incredibly consistent and everything is chosen down to the finest detail in a way that's consistent with his vision of the world. So it's though um, the, you, what, one implication of that is that for an artist creating um, you have to do work if you, everything's going to express your sense of life. Um, but if you want that, the vision of life to be consistent, that is the, that's kind of the, um, where the, the, the blood, sweat and tears comes in. Yeah, let me give a good counter example. Dostoevsky is a beautiful example of integration, even an integration that an objectivist would not, would not really agree with. On the other hand, his style matches his substance and his su style is so evocative of the themes he wants to get at, and they're consistent. Take the novelist Thomas Mann. Ayn Rand points out here in the discussion of a particular thing in literature, plot theme, Thomas Mann will have characters who will talk philosophy, but that philosophy will have actually nothing to do with the storyline of the book. And there we have a gross contradiction. There, there's just a flat out contradiction, which interferes with our appreciation of the art. But the direct contrast to a Dostoevsky, who's so integrated style and substance that you're drawn into his universe and his worldview, even if it's alien to you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so I interject a little bit in case that if anyone in Zoom wants to make a question, please go ahead in the chat. Or if you're on YouTube, please go ahead with a super chat. Uh, we're going to read it. Actually, we have one question dealing with uh, the issue of what is art from Stephanie. She asked if we could give some examples of metaphysical value judgments and how they relate to the art one responds to. And then she adds, is there a branch of art that is best to grasp one, what one's metaphysical value judgment is? Or can music work as well as painting or sculpture or literature or poetry? So I mentioned some of the questions that Ayn Rand thinks the answers to constitute metaphysical value judgments. She also gives in, uh, I, I think it's philosophy and sense of life, or maybe it's art and sense of life, some examples of an actual formulation of a metaphysical value judgment. And it's, she puts them all in, uh, uh, not all, but she puts many of them in terms of um, importance. So it's important to understand things. It's important to obey my parents. It's important to act on my own. It's important to please other people. Um, who am I to stick my neck out? And they don't, uh, they, another way to think about it is that it's in effect, um, they're often in the form of catchphrases, right? Like if you're giving voice, you're not going to get like a kind of like metaphysical value judgment that comes in the form of like a complex philosophic formulation or something. Cause it's, it, they're, they're giving voice to an emotional generalization as I think we'll talk about when we talk about sense of life, probably in a future um, installment. The, but it'll have a kind of catchphrase format. So I think an example, you know, um, you could think of something like I'm in charge of my own life. You know, I can make something of myself. It's a basic view of what's possible to you, what's important in the world. And then in terms of um, grasping one's own, I think that's a complex subject. And I would certainly say, I think that Rand's view, at least let's put it that way, is that 
literature is going to be the primary and easiest place to do it, that it's just much harder, certainly in something like music, but even in the visual arts, at least there's a more limited range of what you can bring out than you can in literature because literature deals with characters over time and it's the conceptual the you know the conceptual medium though i think you can learn a lot from all of them and and it's not that you couldn't learn anything i certainly music taught me a lot it brought out a lot of things um about sort of sense of life for me personally um so i think it's good to expose yourself to a lot of different kinds of art, but I think that ultimately literature is at least in Rand's view, um, probably the easiest and widest ranging in terms of what one would want to engage with for that purpose. Yeah. Well, literature can directly get at it because it uses concepts as its medium. Um, but you know, take any, Ayn Rand gives lots of good examples of different literary views of man, uh, different uh, uh, metaphysical views of man in visual arts. Um, you know, we can take examples. Michelangelo. Michelangelo typically conveys struggle, purposeful struggle, but he also conveys characters who are strong and purposeful. This conveys a view of man and the world. Life is purposeful struggle. But man is this powerful thing, this muscular, dynamic thing that can meet that challenge. Now, when I look at Michelangelo, that's what a purely vi visual art can do to me. It can make me, it can evoke in me the dramatic struggle that life is, the purposeful struggle life is, and a view of humanity that's up to the struggle. Take um, a negative example. <coughs> I take uh, uh, William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies. He shows a bunch of boys trapped on an island together, and they quickly turn into anarchistic monsters who are destroying each other without any sense of values or respect for each other at all. That conveys, as Don says, through literature, through story, through concepts, a very clear and specific view of humanity that you could put in real... I mean, Michelangelo, I had to use very broad abstractions, didn't I? With William Golding, I can s define his very negative view of humanity in a very clear and specific way. Perhaps at the other end of the spectrum is music, but music does convey and can convey metaphysical values. It is not a single emotion that a really good piece of music ever gives us. I guess today in these sampled little snippets of music in pop music or uh, hip hop, we're given very, very narrow little bits. A good piece of music is not just one little discrete emotion. It's an emotional experience. It's an emotional experience. So take Rachmaninoff. Characteristically, he has this yearning, this romantic yearning that you can just feel in his music. And his music will begin subtly and end triumphantly. Doesn't that convey a metaphysical value? yearn and yearn and struggle with that yearning, but it will end in triumph. So a, a, a piano concerto by Rachmaninoff conveys a metaphysical value to me about the nature of, this is what life is to Rachmaninoff. It is about yearning for values, struggling to achieve them and triumphing when we do. Wow, when, when I hear a Rachmaninoff piano concerto, I get that entire metaphysical value judgment. Does that make sense? It does for me, and I think Stephanie <laughs> says yes. Um, we have another question from the iPhone of Black Crow. Um, he asks in relation to something that was mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Uh, do you think that novels that are quite inconsistent in the characters, uh, do they still embody metaphysical abstractions? Oh, I just have to throw, I was gonna let Don go for it. I have to throw in here. No, today, if you can't have a, a 
sophisticated novel for the literati unless your characters are full of contradictions. People aren't black and white. People are mixed bags. Reality is much more complex than that. You don't have clear moral issues. In fact, almost the test is to have gray characters that are a mix. And if you don't do that, well, then you have some simplistic worldview, <clears throat> right? Uh, even that, though, absolutely conveys a metaphysical value. What it's saying is that immoral grays are inevitable. That's all there are, are these various mixed bags. And we all have a little evil in us, just as we all have a little goodness. That you can't say someone is primarily a hero or essentially a good person or mostly a bad person or primarily a villain. That conveys a metaphysical value judgment about humanity, does it not? Just to say that your characters all have to be mixed bags with complicated psychologies who are both doing good and evil things. Yeah, I'll just add one caveat to it because you could be asking a different kind of, so you could be asking at least two different questions. So one is what Jim addressed, which is if you have characters who are inconsistent, but you could be talking about where the artist is kind of just all over the place. And it's not like I tried to create an inconsistent character, but if you think about like, um, you know, a movie that you've seen where a character did something just for plot convenience, be like, they would never do that or something like that. Um, there, there's a real question of, is this conveying anything, uh, uh, any kind of view of the world? And that's what I was talking about where um, there's, if, an, if a person is a garbage artist, and I don't mean garbage like we don't agree with him, but he doesn't really know what he's doing. So I would put like, well, let me give you a specific example. My novel and its first drafts had a lot of things where it was the characters acting in ways that are clashing with how the character acted early on because I hadn't gotten the characterization consistent. Now, if I had released the book in that form, the book wouldn't say anything. It would just be kind of event, event, event. Um, it would not really have a metaphysical worldview, but it's if you're once you're talking about like it's a real product of um, a an artist who has some lens, and if you're talking about the the inconsistency of characterization, then yes, I think it has a very very specific kinds of uh, it's saying something very specific about life, as Jim talked about. Yeah, you can't. It's not that you can't have an inconsistent or a mixed bag character. Because there are, most people are, to some degree, mixed mixed bags. It's the way you approach that, right? D Dagny Taggart herself has an issue to overcome. She doesn't really, spoiler alert, she doesn't really grasp evil, really concretely grasp evil. She's so good, she only has her own introspection and her own optimistic, benevolent values. And it, the climax is her discovery, in effect. So, in effect, she's learning something. She's on a learning curve, very much like Dominique is on a learning curve. So you can have characters who are learning, who are uh, in some way and to some degree mixed bags. Uh, think of a bunch of characters in Ayn Rand's novels that are very much like that, in between characters, right? That realistically conveys a sense of what humans are too. But she also, also has heroes and villains. People who you can say, yeah, this is mostly a good person. This is mostly a bad person because that's reality too. That's her metaphysical understanding of the world. Um, yeah, the, the, it, 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 just a quick way to think about it. So inconsistent is maybe not the best word. So it's that um, it, you want, there's such a thing as consistently conflicted right? Like it's Hank Reardon has a conflict, but he's consistent with that conflict and right. he acts consistently. And what bad art is, is it's inconsistent in the sense of that it's not saying anything about the characters because there's no coherence to even the inconsistent way they act. Exactly. And that's, that's the bad kind. Uh, that that's just bad writing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now in, in light of that, um, I was wondering if, if uh, you have any comment dealing with the, the story of Christ as such, um, James, um, because it has been labeled as the greatest story ever told, but at the same Which time... Which is the best branding ever made. Yes. <laughs> God, what a PR person they had, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I personally never found it to be extremely interesting, uh, but 
do you think that some of the way in which Jesus is per portrayed have any personal emotional input with people like really or or not really yes I think I think it appeals to a certain psychology I absolutely think that is more than that I think the interesting thing about the New Testament for example ancient texts of this kind uh, are an example of what Ayn Rand was saying sure Jesus gives a moral philosophy on the Sermon on the Mount but the real essence of what's going on in the Gospels is telling the story of Jesus and it's telling the fable of a highly mythologized character named Jesus that conveys most importantly the moral ideal if self-sacrifice altruism is the ethics you want to convey you could have Jesus give a big lecture on it and he kind of does but more powerfully you can show Jesus washing the feet of his disciples sacrifice basically committing public suicide for the sake of humanity he's willing to sacrifice himself and he turns around and says carry your own cross duplicate my example and it's that example <clears throat> that really is the powerful thing that most religions and every moral philosophy that i'm aware of eventually has a fable a fictional projection a story a narrative a hero Christianity well, was... actually... Go ahead, Sorry. Jim. Sorry. Yeah. Christianity projects most of its values through the character of Jesus. And in fact, what's interesting is that we have the saying, uh, 20th century theology in Christianity developed the saying, what would Jesus do? Well, as far as I'm aware, Ayn Rand developed that formulation in this essay, right? What would Howard Rourke do? She asks the question and she points out that most religions have such a fable, a story, which is a far more powerful way of communicating, especially to the young, a moral ideal. And I'll just say, I mean, it's being flippant, but the there is a sense in which it's, I mean, it's a great story in the sense that there's great books. It's that the best man is killed in the worst way in order to redeem corrupt let's call it you know corrupt people sinful people and that there's there's a real um like that's an incredible story in the sense of it's tackling some of the biggest ideas in the in a very um in a very revolutionary way like that is a real it, we take it for granted but that's such an innovative idea now there's a whole question of exactly how that story gets formulated and you know the contributions of different authors but um but I think that's a great story. I mean, it, it, it's it's presenting a philosophy I think is awful, and it's not told in a modern way. Like you have to read it to to get you know the it's it's kind of like um, you know almost like a Homeric epic. Like you have to do some work to kind of experience the story as a story. Um, but I mean, that's a profound story with profound you know thematic implications. They're just really bad implications. I mean, let's assume you believed in an afterlife and a God and just took those things for granted. Let's assume you believed that humanity was somehow inherently corrupt and needed redemption. If you worked with those, if you had those as working premises, this story would be extremely powerful, wouldn't it? The thing that it's mostly interesting for me in that story is that it's someone that is born it's not highborn like they would say and i've been reading a little bit of uh, greek mythology and even the men heroes are highborn when you say uh Theseus, Perseus, um uh, oedipus all of them have royal so, uh, yeah. even moses has right. any some royal things and, and genealogy is important in the hebrew scriptures uh so here we have another question dealing with the what exactly are normative abstract abstractions uh the essay says the they evaluate facts isn't that what emotions do couldn't you give some examples of a normative abstraction in contrast to a cognitive abstraction 
does art affect co cognitive and normative abstractions differently? Well, I mean, here's, if you want to get, here's a cognitive uh, abstraction or at least abstract statement. It's, um, you know, heroin is a depressant. Here's a normative one. Don't take heroin, <laughs> right? Right. So it's any, the normatives are going to be some form of valuation, some form of should. Now, Ayn Rand thinks that there's aesthetic uh, abstractions have their own category. And there it's the important, right? So it's, you, you have is, should, uh, important. And those are kind of the three different kinds of abstractions that she thinks uh, exist. I don't fully understand the question, does art affect cognitive and normative abstractions differently? Um, well, it, it's, she thinks that they, that it's, art that's helping shape your formulation of your normative abstractions, not your cognitive ones, right? Like, it's not like you read Atlas Shrugged and, um, well, now I know something about the way reality is, though it can help you, it can draw your attention to certain features of reality you might not have thought about. I mean, Atlas Shrugged obviously probably taught us a lot about what is, right? About man's, but it doesn't prove any of that, right? And, um, but it's, if you have certain cognitive, uh, if the, what's the way to put it? Art is not necessary in order to reach cognitive abstractions, but she thinks it is necessary in order to reach and to hold normative abstractions is the way I would put it. Right. I'd have to put it this way. Emotions are not tools of cognition. So, Art and its effect as such does not inform our cognition as such. Okay. That the don't that doesn't work that way. The, what she's indicating is that the cycle that the psychoepistemological function of words is similar and analogous to the psychoepistemological function of art, in that they both render perceptual the abstract so that we can deal with them in one way or another. But cognition is cognition. Emotionally experiencing our values is emotionally experiencing our values. Both are critical to the healthy functioning of the mind. In fact, you know, the healthy psychological part actually contributes to you know, a sound cogn cogn cognitive functioning. On the other hand, we have to keep that distinct. Emotions are not tools of cognition. So right after talking about normative abstractions, she goes over uh, the Rourke example as an empathizer, uh, as someone that you can show as an example of a particular code of uh, ethics or something, uh, or not something precise, like it's a particular embodiment of a particular set of ideas. And it's way much useful to see that kind of uh, um, perceptual embodiment than a whole discussion of ethics, for, for instance, she says. I was wondering if uh, you could explain more why is that? Why is it more important take, to see? Take free will. If you really don't believe in free will, let's say you're some kind of Calvinist determinist who thinks God's got it all worked out, right? That's going to affect the way you're going to respond to certain kinds of art. If you're showing Jean Valjean and Victor Hugo as making choices and having those choices have consequences, that's not my view of the world. Why are you misleading people? A Calvinist might say into thinking they have some kind of control over their lives and that the decisions they make might actually have consequences in their life. Why would you have a logical plot that hinges on Jean Valjean's choices? It wouldn't make any sense. <clears throat> so Le Miserable embodies a view of free will. Embodies a view of free will. Certain kinds of tragedies embody a view of determinism. This was fate. He couldn't avoid it. This was inevitable. This was his tragic flaw. And all we're seeing is Macbeth's tragic flaw maybe working out. Because that's the way life is. 
Yeah, I don't think she says that um, a work of art is more important than an ethical treatise. So there's a sense in which she's talking about, yeah, like you can ask yourself what would work do and get the answer, but she doesn't actually think you can function that way. So her view is not that you can boil ethics down to what would Howard work do, because there's a real question that you face, which is with art is what would it mean to emulate this person? And there's the kind of, you know, uh, tales from back in the day where people would dye their hair orange and, Oh, I admire Howard work. So I'm going to become an architect. And so what you have to be able to separate out is what are the things that are universal that cause me to admire work that I want to emulate? And what are the things that are particular to Rourke versus particular to me? And that's where you need ethics to be able to define the universal principles that should govern you. But it's that you can't understand or apply those principles without the vision of Rourke. And that's the thing. It's that you need both, that they're both vital and you you one can't exist without the other and so it's in that sense um that like there she's getting what you can say is not that it's more valuable to have art but that it's in effect easier to communicate a moral ideal that what would take pages and pages and pages and still wouldn't quite do it in an ethical treatise would not convey what you get just with the image of Rourke, but you still need that treatise. Right. Well, obviously she still wrote nonfiction and write about philosophy and ethics in particular. But, uh, you know, it's interesting though, uh, Don, she does quote Aristotle as saying that literature is more important than history. As a historian, that really grabs me uh, because it, as Aristotle said, it doesn't show life as it actually was, but as it could be and ought to be. I don't think she would have said the same about epistemology. <laughs> I think she really actually would have said, no, epistemology has primacy even over literature. And also more or less based on this, um, she discusses a little bit the role of ethics. And one of the things I'm not completely cl clear about here, is one able to create art without a code of ethics, an implicit code of ethics. And I'm speaking probably something like uh, not literature, but something more like sculpture or even... Oh yeah, you do not need a code of ethic, a code of ethics to do painting and literature and music. You don't, even literature, even literature. You don't need a code of ethics to create a nice short story, a nice poem. They imply value. That's why Ayn Rand defines it at that level. They only imply metaphysical value judgments. They do not necessarily imply an entire philosophy. They imply a kind of worldview without implying answers or consistent answers to an actual philosophy. So no, you don't, in fact, I'll go broader. You don't need to know your philosophy to be an artist, even a good artist. Um, and what, what are the consequences of different types of art over one, oneself? Um, I'm, I'm speaking of, uh, for instance, could art in a specific period have, uh, um, an embitterment or effect on you, uh, if it, if the art was pretty good, but at the same time could it have a, uh, an effect that could harm you if you're good, but the art is bad. Um, I'm speaking, for instance, if you're kind of a um, nice person, but everything goes over in the Middle Ages in, in right in Europe, where all that you can see is drawings in, in books. Very much believed a person could be crushed by their culture around them. It definitely has an effect on us. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. Because art serves a vital psychological and psychoepistemological function, it's important to have art that actually inspires, that actually reflects our positive values. It helps keep us inspired and motivated, keeps us going, keeps those values real to us in a concrete way. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Now, can artists be better or worse than their culture? Absolutely. Look at Ayn Rand. She was in the midst of what 
she regarded as cultural bankruptcy. And did her art serve as a beacon for me in my culture? Woo, a huge one. Absolutely. And can you imagine the soul crushing effect of medieval art on the populace? Oh yeah. That's her whole point. Thank you. And so I, for some reason, I was going over another essay of Ayn Rand called Altruism as Appeasement, which basically deals why uh, some people which are intelligent usually give up their souls to some people that sometimes don't even ask for their souls. And one of the um, uh, paragraphs, she says that the state of art in that uh, period is reflective of this kind of people. I was wondering if you have any insights on, on that. I think it connects to a, a few of the things we've been talking about. Yeah. So the, her, her view in, in that essay is that, you know, there's a phenomenon and most people who are in this call will probably have had some version of it, which is you're young and intelligent and you can feel very alienated from the people around you who aren't interested in ideas, aren't interested in big questions, are suspicious of you uh, and probably think you're weird or at least treat you a little bit as an outsider because of your interests and ideas. And her view is that um, what often happens is those people reach a certain stage where they expect to find a better universe of other people who share their interests and they get to college and tend not to find it. And that it takes a real heroic achievement to maintain that um, your intellectual independence, particularly in the value realm. And that what often happens is that people in effect surrender the value realm and try to like appease the the mob that they think is out there that's inimical to ideas, inimical to the mind. And they become in one form or another, you know, preachers of altruism and like, oh, I'm just doing, you know, all my thinking it's for the good of society. You know, don't, don't hate me. Let me be part of your club. And so she thinks that one of the consequences of that is that over time you develop the feeling that like you sold out your soul and you have to rationalize that and say, well, I had to. That's what life is, that there is this mob of evil out there. Evil is powerful. What are you going to do? I had no choice. And so one of the things that is part of her view of psychology is when those people encounter somebody who's good, self-confident, efficacious, that person stands as a reproach to them. If you think about people's reactions to Rourke, and she describes it early in The Fountainhead as a lot of people, they, first of all, they had strong reactions to him and often it was negative. And she thinks that's part of what happens with good people is that they set off alarm bells for bad people. And so part of what then a person with this kind of appeasing um, and uh, like who, um, who've given in to that kind of uh, appeasement that, she thinks that what they want from art is a confirmation that you were right to give in. This is how life is. And that that shows up in liking, you know, art that's focused in the sewer that says that happiness is impossible, that the good cannot succeed. But there's another connection to it too, which is we've talked about the need for art as a positive. You need to be able to hold your ideas intellectually, your, your view of reality um, in order to understand it and apply it. And then that you need that for fuel. You need to be able to hold on to that vision of life. And so let's rewind the tape back to that kid who gets to college and the people around him are the same, you know, bullies that he dealt with in kindergarten and in middle school and in high school. How do you retain that intellectual independence and the, and the idea that I need to stay in my quest for values and my view of the good and not try to, you know, win over um, through my own cowardice, the mob. You need art for that. And Jim was mentioning the kind of boy in the bicycle moment. And that's a lot of what Ayn Rand provided many of us. Uh, I, there's some of us in the objectivist world who inevitably, I think, would have, inevitably is not the right word, but who probably 
would have given in in some form were it not for the fact that we had this fuel that Ayn Rand provided that, no, you know what? It's hard, but keep your eye on the long game. And the long game is you can achieve the life of a Rourke or a Dagny and like, don't let that go. And so it, I think this article is a real helpful way to concretize um, that perspective. I mean, Ayn Rand explores it in other places. Uh, Art and moral treason is probably the biggest one. But it's it's the, we see both there the what happens when you don't hold on to that vision of what's possible, and then it's what happens to those people. What do they turn to then? It's art, not as refueling, but art as um, comforting them with more rationalization and, and the and basically a uh, a license to continue in their hatred of the good and lethargy. Precisely. When I was a teenager and read The Fountainhead, I knew that I wasn't completely Howard Roar, but I knew that the best parts of me were. It gave me a vision of what I could be and that if I could get myself, get bring, it was a command to rise. If I could bring that part out of me that I knew was the best part of me, I could, ha I could achieve my happiness and self-satisfaction. If it weren't for Dagny Taggart, as a projection and Atlas Shrugged, I wouldn't have known what it was I was looking for romantically. What was important to me, that a woman like that could be possible for me. Talk about metaphysical value judgments. This is what art can do for us in a profound way. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I see Stephanie has a question that I just want to answer real quickly because it's a good one. Um, so we always say like emotions aren't tools of cognition. Cognition, yes. Can emotions be characterized as tools at all? If so, of what? And I think yes, they can. Um, but it's you could say it's tools of experiencing and identifying your values. So emotions are giving you automatic access to your values, or at least a first pass of that. You have to think. Am I because there's a cognitive element too, and you can have an emotion that comes from misidentifying something. Um, tools of introspect introspection. Yeah, I like that. I know. I think that's right. it's that um, they definitely serve a purpose, but it's not a cognitive purpose, yeah. but it is a purpose of Enjoyment. here's your thing. values, and yeah. you couldn't get at them at any other way. Right. How do we enjoy life? How are we motivated? And what evidence do we have of our subconscious values? They're all critical. It's critical evidence. It's critical motivation. It's it's critical to enjoy life. Uh, so yeah, they serve vital functions, uh, critical to our life. Just not a strictly cognitive one. Well, thank you very much uh, with that uh, last comment. I appreciate a lot, James and Don, uh, this talk, sadly. The time is up. I would. There were a couple of questions that I would like have luck to go over, but sadly, it will be for another time. Um, I think Rassi is asking me for uh, to tell you that next week we're gonna discuss the metaphysical versus the man-made here next Wednesday. Uh, if you like this kind of topics, please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.